and uh, welcome back from lunch. Uh, my name's Matt Bold. I'm from Lockheed Martin Space. I'm with the Advanced Technology Center in uh, Palo Alto, California. Uh, my job, I build, I build spacecraft. I build payloads. Um, we launch them, we operate them, and uh, I have responsibility uh, that I've had for a number of years at looking at space security and space safety for, for us and all of our customers. So this, this whole area is near and dear to, uh, to my heart. Um, I thank you guys, Mariba and Diane, for the intro that sets the stage for this. Uh, I, I, you know, someone said earlier that, you know, there is the, if you look at the futures, there's the known, the unknown, and there's the unbelievable. So I've, I've been in this field for quite a while. I've seen a lot of things, um, but the last five, seven years have just been amazing changes. I would go ahead and roll that. I would say that we are literally entering the world of, of what I call the unbelievable. You know, I, I see this and go, yeah, like, no. They're going the wrong way. They should be going up, not landing. This, this is truly uh, uh, an amazing time in space. We are you know, seeing uh, uh, new companies come in and disrupt uh, how we do space launch. We have companies that are looking at launching satellites weekly. Uh, we are launching satellites that are deploying uh, you know, 100 plus units at a time. Um, we are seeing amazing capabilities come out of those. I, my kids, I have, a, I have a college student and a high school student, and both can get involved in a satellite, in, in developing it, designing it, uh, and, and operating it. Uh, this is not the space that I came into when I started my career. Um, I, have, I have written down three purposes of this session that I think I would like to come away from knowing that we've accomplished. Um, the first, I wanna tell you about uh, this, the, the law games, uh, the space law games, um, and, and just uh, get your input and, and put you on a path to become stakeholders that are providing input to that process and, and in getting involved. Um, I, I wanna inform you uh, about what is going on in space, what are the challenges we have in space. Uh, every one of you in here is a stakeholder in the capabilities that we have in space. Uh, it, a lot of it is transparent to you. Uh, I know people have talked today and other days about uh, GPS. Uh, by the way, GPS is great for getting you to the store and getting you here. It's more important in that it's a timestamp on every banking transaction that you make and it is the time that goes into the encryption codes on all of the, the computer encryption software that you utilize. So you, whether you realize it or not, use this every day. But we are transitioning from a strategic space where we have large platforms, uh, billion dollar systems that are shared among different users, different agencies, to uh, moving to a tactical environment where the Army even, will be launching satellites that provide capabilities to specific missions on very short time scales. So uh, I think this is a very timely meeting that we're having and, and a timely topic because uh, you, you, you need to be aware of what's going on. And, and you know, we're going to present to you uh, a problem set, and, and it, it's, it's a daunting problem set. It's not meant to frighten you, uh, you should be worried, but uh, my hope is that all the innovators in here, all the students uh, from all the different disciplines can be inspired by this challenging problem and want to get involved and, and help bring solutions to this. We are at a, at a, a crossover in, in the space community and, and uh, we need a lot of help, we need everyone involved um, and uh, we, need to, um, we need to make some progress really quick. Um, oh, it's a build chart. I hate when they do build charts. All right. Um, the, the agenda for, for this, this hour, um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story. The story is going to set the stage for our discussions uh, this afternoon. Um, 
I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to make a plug for the, for the space law games that we're beginning to organize uh, and, and inform you about that a little bit. I'm going to come back to the panel, and I'm going to ask each one of the panelists, so think about this while you're sitting here, um, in the scenario that I'm about to give you, what role do you play in that? So I want you to introduce yourself, name where you're from, what your organization or department, and tell us what role you think you play in, in, this, in, this, in space and in this particular scenario. And then we're going to begin a lively discussion. So I'll kick off with a question, but then I, we're going to invite all of you to, to start to plug the panel with questions on how are we going to solve, solve these problems. Right. So it's January 15th this year, 2019. Um, and after a two-week delay, a rocket was launched out of a commercial launch facility overseas. And it's currently, or in, on the 15th, was accelerating its payload up to an altitude of 800 kilometers above the Earth. Uh, they, they did the things they were supposed to do. They registered the, the, the satellite. They notified their local aviation authorities. Um, but they really didn't file a flight plan, and they didn't file uh, an operation or mission plan. So we, we know it went up, and we don't really know what's going on after that. Um, they had hoped to launch this on New Year's Day. It would have been a really cool thing to launch on New Year's Day. But they were delayed two weeks. There was a glitch in their command and control software. Uh, some some uh, quick thinking by some software guys. And uh, they were able to get uh, effects made and upload it to the satellite while it's sitting on the launch pad. And, uh, and get the launch gone on the 15th. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, the rocket releases its payload. And a new satellite is, is released for an ambitious startup company. Um, this is the third satellite that this startup company has launched. The first two completed their missions very, very well. Great press releases come out. Uh, the purpose of the satellite, it's a space tug. All right? It's an on-orbit servicing system. It was contracted by another satellite owner and operator to go up and retrieve their dead satellite. It had an, an early mortality. And they wanted to get it out of, a way, out of the way so they could replace it with another system and, and, and keep it from being in harm's way and being uh, uh, an inhibitant to other operators. So the mission's going well. The two satellites are orbiting the same plane, and the space tug is beginning its rendezvous operations. So on Tuesday of this week, while we are all on airplanes and in cars, or maybe already here, um, the two objects began their proximity operations. Uh, the space tug is just 250 meters away from the object it's trying to deorbit, and the two objects are together in an intricate dance, orbiting around the Earth at thousands of kilometers an hour. Um, yesterday, as we were all sitting here, unbeknownst to us, unbeknownst to anyone else, the two objects began their approach, and things started going wrong. And when they go wrong, they go wrong quickly. Um, we're really not sure what happened. It's a series of unfortunate events. Uh, the first thing that we know is that the object to be captured had a slight tumble to it. This was known. This was anticipated. This was to be the most ambitious uh, capture of this startup's uh, program to demonstrate their real capabilities, but the flight computer is completely overloaded with this task. Um, as the two objects approach, there's a charge on each that was not calculated correctly. There's a field that disrupts some of the systems on board the tug. Um, this causes some glitches in the software and in some of the systems, one of which is that the ground controllers still are receiving telemetry, they're still seeing what's going on, but they cannot issue commands to, to their tug. It's fine, this is an automated system. It's designed to complete its mission autonomously, uh, and it starts to do so, except that another one of those glitches sends an errant command to one of the thrusters, starts to fire full power, and shoves the tug a lot of momentum into the satellite that it was attempting to gently capture. This breaks off a number of key pieces. It causes a rupture of the hydrazine tank. 
um, still had fuel, and we have debris that's flown off and is flying about into other orbits. Um, both the, the tug company and the satellite operator decide to just keep quiet about this. It's not going to cause any harm. They want to know what's going on before they issue any release of information. Uh, otherwise, their stock prices could really take a tumble. Um, it's going to be another 20 hours, unfortunately, until this piece of debris happens to be picked up by the United States' uh, space fence situated in Kwajalein. So it's flying about, and no one really knows that it's there. Uh, unfortunately, it happens to fly into the path of a satellite that was recently launched by the U.S. Army. The satellite has a new ground mapping radar on board. It was launched last week as a tactical mission to supply ground forces with relevant data over and up to their target area. The debris object disables that satellite. So the, the fortunate part is that none of the ground forces had started their operations. No one was put in harm's way. The unfortunate part was that the mission was completely scrubbed. Months of, of uh, planning and tracking uh, had seen their target gone. Uh, the satellite also is a complete loss. So this scenario is not science fiction. Uh, there are startups today that are planning uh, on-orbit servicing and have already started doing initial tests. It is also not science fiction that the U.S. Army would have their own satellites, as the U.S. Army is looking at a, uh, a small sat and it's in a test mode to see if they could provide near real time or precision information that's mission specific. Um, so this is, this is a challenge for us. We are starting to pull together what we call the law games. I'm going to find dense and there we go. Um, our, our objectives here are to not just have another uh, uh, um, moot court and, and get the, the law department involved, but to bring together disciplines that are the operators, the uh, technical community, the legal community, the policy community, and the stakeholders. Again, you are part of that stakeholder community to understand not just how will this how will this court proceeding go down if there's litigation? But what, what could we have done prior to this event that would have prevented it? How can we contain it? How do we clean up after it? How do we assign liability? What's the rule of evidence? And, and how do we begin to formulate a, uh, a, a community of best practices, rules of the road, policies, regulations that keep space a safe operating environment and one that we can uh, continue to access. So um, this is just one of, of two scenarios that we're looking at. Uh, I, I call out to a shout out to two people who can't be here today, but I know that are listening. Uh, Dins Dinsley with uh, Northern Space Security and uh, um, outside of Newcastle and uh, Chris Newman, who is a professor at uh, Northumbria University School of Law, are the, the ones that are picking up the, the most of this effort. They're the heavy lifters. This is, this is their baby. To um, have a series of activities, we are now counting this as one of the first activities. Um, so con congratulations. I feel like I should hand out certificates to everyone else here as a space law participant. Uh, but these are a series of activities that are going to go on for the rest of this year and probably well into the future to continue to look at scenarios like this, to address the engineering challenges, to address the legal challenges, the policy challenges, just as any warfighter would use a war game and scenarios in a war game to understand the complexity of the landscape. We are trying to do the same thing for space. As we sit here today, unprepared to take care of business that we have in front of us, certainly unprepared to take care of the business that is 5, 10, 15 years down the road. So with the scenario, and I'll come over there with you, um, I, we're going to start asking some questions and work our way through understanding what has happened. 
And I'm going to ask the first question, and then we'll turn this over to, um, to, to the audience to join in and participate. Um, so what could we have done? What should the parties who were involved done to prevent such an event from happening in the first place? What are the sorts of procedures, techniques, technologies that would have saved the army from losing their, their critical satellite? And, well, I'm sorry, we were supposed to introduce ourselves. See, I can't even follow my own agenda. Let's do that first. Yes, uh, my name is Mora Baja. I'm an associate professor in aerospace engineering here at University of Texas at Austin. Did you want to hear about my role yet or no? Just do well, intros. I, what, what role do you play in this, this scenario? Yeah, I would say that my role is in uh, the tracking of, of the objects and just having a body of evidence of orbital trajectories. Uh, I'm Smita. I'm uh, doing uh, my executive master's here in software engineering. Uh, my role is um, is the software tester who signed off on you know sending this object into space. My name is uh, CC Williams. I work here as a graduate research assistant, assistant with Dr. Ja. Um, my role would be to assist in uh, this problem solving capabilities of satellites. Hi, my name is Daniel Mish, and I'm a second year law student here at the University of Texas School of Law, and also a Brumley Next Generation Graduate Fellow with the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and as um, taking the law perspective, both establishing liability after the fact, but also what kind of regulations, rules, um, best practices can we establish ahead of the fact in order to incentivize actors so this kind of incident doesn't occur. And you've already met me. I'm Diane Howard. I'm a non-resident scholar at the Strauss Center, also uh, teaching through the School of Law some of these space law issues. My role in this scenario is to be a government attorney advisor. Right. So. Engineers, software, uh, and, and, and CC. What, what would you have done? What, what went wrong? What, if we do a fault analysis, right, to this whole mission. Where, where were the faults and what would you have done to prevent this? Um, so first off, what uh, I would think of is that there should be maybe a third party source where maybe you wouldn't have to say exactly what your mission is, but to report to that source that's tracking and uh, detecting that the satellite, somebody's satellite has lost control of their attitude. They don't, they don't have the, the, the satellite that disrupted the uh, capturing mission of the deactivated satellite. Um, that, that, that company should have reported to someone, we, we can't control this anymore. We don't have the ability to turn, but we can tell you that it's in this location and it's out of, we, it's out of our control. Um, well, the, this thing is not something that's common. It's not a common scenario, right? So when you're doing something like this, you're just being bold in doing it. So you're signing off based on your own rules, not anybody else's rules since it hasn't been done before. So that's the action that you took? So let me, let me, I mean, I'm gonna open this up to other questions, but let me pick on that. Is, is that. is that true? I mean, is that the case with, you know, self-driving cars, with other, other automated systems? Uh, is it, a, do we take that it's a bold move and there's risk involved and, and that sort of, what, what comes of it? That's a good point. Now, self-driving cars are more common. It's more close to home. You have so many more humans involved, right? So to the general public, space is something that they're really not concerned about. You pointed out that we all should be concerned about it, but if you're not, and who else? I mean, how many people are doing this, especially if I need to do this in secrecy? 
how many people am I going to consult with to, to know that you know, this is good to go? Just based on the confidence that I have in my skills and I'm making it go. So that's an interesting point. Diane, what do you make of that? I couldn't hear completely. That's why I was sort of trying to do this. So um, one thing that I will say is that um, one of my first questions would be, you know, what are the nationalities of all the different players in this scenario? Who are the launching states? Who procured the launch? Who performed the launch? From whose territory and from whose facility did the launch occur? And then I'd also drill down on, um, because this is also going to give us information about who actually got licensed. So um, were these different launching states, were they parties to any treaties, any of the space treaties? If so, which ones? And did these launching states also have any national law? Because there is an Article VI obligation in the Outer Space Treaty that uh, launching states and, and uh, state parties have a, they authorize or license uh, launches and also continually supervise what happens. And so there's going to be an element of, of you know, who these launching states are and what the national laws and how this is actually implemented in this. And that's going to say whether or not this was a really bold move or not. If it's a really bold move, then, then chances are it's going to be less likely that they're going to be licensed. So did they actually do their due diligence in providing information? And did they actually do their due diligence in the modeling to, to perform the safety reviews necessary to get licensed? So that's my response. Questions from, from the audience? Uh, oh, Okay, folks, I fed you. Wake up and ask good questions. That's how, that's how this works. No free, there's no free chicken on a mad scientist conference. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit out of the uh, legalistic side because I could first ask you, and I, I'm interested in knowing, okay, you just cost the U.S. Army hundreds of millions of dollars. Who am I, who, who am I going to sue and how am I going to get my money back? So there's a legal part of that. The other part of that is... How do I know this isn't a first, a first um, move in conflict? Is this an act of war in some way? Cyberspace, there's all kinds of actions in cyberspace, some of them not nice actions, which don't reach the threshold of an act of war. At least we haven't gone that far yet. Uh, in this case, could an event like this be a form of a first strike? And if so, where do, legally, where do we think it crosses as far as legalities of uh, it being an act of war. So I kind of have a, a question from a legal point of view and one from a point of view of the legalities of an act of war. Yeah. Well, so, 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 so as they're thinking about this, um, one of the things that I would want to do from a technical perspective is try to understand uh, beyond what uh, you know Diane said in terms of context what other objects were in the neighborhood at the time and I'd like to test the hypothesis that some other object uh, interfered with the communications the signal or the capability of the rendezvousing object uh, to cause that anomaly so I would want to test that hypothesis and see how likely or unlikely that is before I just decide to uniquely interrogate uh, what seems to be the, the obvious culprit uh, in, in this scenario. I, th uh, I think on the, I don't have too much experience and background on international law when it comes to armed conflict. Um, and this is a topic that you see a lot in the cybersecurity space where a lot of the the UN Charter, when it talks about a um, a forceful act, is we're talking about physical acts, and so a lot of this is based upon intent. And so when we're looking at this, if it's debris, and if the intentionality isn't there from the first satellite, it's hard to really necessarily say it's at the point where 
you know, the first satellite intentionally caused some kind of harm. If you, because we are dealing with physical damage, it is a little more clear than if it was kind of jamming or a cybersecurity issue. But the system, um, we, we're really looking at intentionality, which is really difficult to attribute in this case, especially if we don't have the history, if we don't understand exactly what's normal. If this is a bold, uh, as we talked about earlier, if this is a bold new kind of maneuver, we don't necessarily know what that looks like then. We don't know if this is, what they were doing was in line with what you would expect from an act like this, or if they really were a lot more aggressive than they needed to be, and it crossed over into the uh, intentionality requirement of were they purely trying to um, just kind of delicately move, or were they, you know, on the intentionality wise, kind of create more debris in order to kind of collide with the other satellite? And I think this is exacerbated by the fact that it was the debris that took out the Army satellite. So I think if we're looking at, you know, the, the cause comes from the surge, which then shoved the now not optimally operating tug into the satellite it was trying to get out of the way, which created the debris, that was a debris creating incident. So that to then try to assign some sort of malintent to that is really difficult because it, it's a causal chain that's broken by the fact that this debris was, was caused, it wasn't planned on. Now, you could take it a step back and if that surge had some sort of, was caused in some way, and that's certainly not impossible because we do, we know that jamming exists and this is certainly a way to interfere with the activities of others. So I would say that if there is a way that we could then, what's the word that you all use, disambiguate? If you could disambiguous <laughs> the, the cause of the surge from the actual debris causing incident, that you might have a better chance of being able to determine if there was some malintent that you could then go and, and, and base some actions on. So my question is, the, since this is in, uh, uh, the launching of a satellite isn't something that happens every day, um, how much from a execution standpoint is risk calculated in, in, into the equation and then Subsequently, how much risk, uh, how much is risk factored into the legal aspect of the act that occurred? So, so, so from the technical perspective, um, could you somewhat repeat the risk thing again? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So as, as you develop the software and, and put the satellite into space, that... We, since we don't live in a perfect world and this, you know, obviously there's test, testing and, and the like that's done ahead of time, but there's, is there a certain amount of risk that is accepted regardless of how well you test it, uh, that the, the entity that puts that satellite into space uh, has to take on that responsibility? Yeah, so I would say that, that there is a certain uh, level of risk that is accepted. I will say that, by and large, I would say, unfortunately, in our community, there's a huge amount of ignorance, kind of the unknown unknowns. An example of that is, you know, when India broke the record launching 104 things at the same time, I believe it was this time, like February of last year or whatever, or the year before on the PSLV, I actually spoke to the Indian government, the people that did that, and I said, did you, what risk did you kind of consider when you put 104 things out at the same time? And they said, oh, we have excellent engineers that made sure that the 104 things wouldn't collide with each other as they got deployed. And I said, bravo, necessary but insufficient, because what about the risk of the 104 things against the background clutter in the orbit that you put them in? And they said, well, we don't have that information. The, the, you know, no, nobody's providing us with accurate knowledge of where everything else is in space. So, so, so 
why do we have that responsibility? So this is the thing. People are taking some risks and they know that there is a lot that they don't know and kind of say, I can't do anything about that. And so I'm just going to ca calculate the things that I can and, and then vaya con Dios and see what happens. You know? uh, I'm going to jump in here as, a, as someone who builds and launches spacecraft and payloads, or my company does. And that is, you know, that, that is a change that has occurred. Uh, there's there's a, a, one of the, one of the um, new entrants into the space community uh, is not a record holder, but they, they regularly launch 60 satellites at a time. And they reported very proudly that, uh, and mind this is not a criticism, this is just a reflection of, of what's going on in the community, that of the 60 they launched, one remained within the, the, the launching canister. They knew where 50, um, 56 of the other ones were. And then there were three that uh, they had no clue what happened to them. And, and they were very satisfied with this. this was a, these were good statistics. When you know, we were building satellites, we still are building satellites, uh, and you know, you're building a billion dollar system and you have a large company like Lockheed Martin uh, whose reputation is, is established on that, uh, you know, knock on wood, we, we haven't lost a satellite. Um, you, you put a lot of engineering rigor into it because it is your reputation, is your business. But the business model is changing. And now we have, we have operators who are working on venture capital and are far, more, uh, far less risk averse than any of the previous standard uh, launching and, and satellite operator companies. And I'll talk a little bit to the legal side of that quickly. Um, so as far as I know, neither in American uh, law or on an international level, there hasn't been a case litigated like this. Um, to abstract a little bit, if there was a case brought forward, I think a court, there's several ways to look upon it and it really depends upon intent, but if it was unintentional, we'd look at it from a negligence perspective. And so two of the, the first elements we look at from a negligence framework is, was there a duty of care and did the act breach it? And risk really factors into that duty of care. And by duty of care, I mean, and it, you can really put this a lot of ways, it's up to the court how to decide, but one way to look at it is what are the legislative, the statutory requirements? So what um, we have the FCC and PRM right now for a riddle debris mitigation. And so you would look at what is required if you're to get a license. That doesn't really apply here, but that's an example of something that could be required by statute. You can look at best practices. So if everyone in the industry has, and th if we're, this is a new scenario, um, let's say it's well established, this is how you conduct these kind of operations. The court could look and say, well, everyone else does this, or the vast majority does this, and you didn't do that. Or you can look at um, this kind of community norm. So all those things go into what is the duty of care, what is the responsibility, and how careful do you have to be? And so risk factors into that because if something is extremely risky, then the community could say, well, we don't undertake this kind of generally, or these are the kind of requirements you would have to undertake if you want to do some sort of activity. So after the fact, that's something that a court could look at and just kind of take all these different things into consideration on considering risk in this environment. So I'll add to that, I, um, Daniel's correct. and. And I think it was a very good example to use the FCC because here in the U.S., the FCC has the, the closest thing to on-orbit jurisdiction that we, we have in our uh, domestic space law. And we're talking about an on-orbit risk, if I'm not mistaken. So um, risk, acceptable thresholds of risk, are definitely a part of a launch license here in the U.S. They're also definitely a part of the, um, the safety metrics that are involved in range, from a range safety perspective when you're uh, doing a military launch or a government launch um, from a federal launch site. Um, but they're generally, um, they're only concerned with the, the launch and they're concerned with the general uninvolved public. So they're not factoring in the risk that 
the orbit, on orbit risk, nor does uh, any one agency other than the FCC with regard to telecommunication satellites have that kind of jurisdiction. And here I'm going to make the baseline assumption that our tug company um, perhaps is a U.S. company. And if it, that's the case, then, then it's, it's sort of uh, it rather, uh, it's not well developed. And this is a very big issue right now is how do we go ahead and do, how do we authorize that activity? So I would absolutely agree that this would be a part of the business case. And because things at one time, it looked like the launch was the riskiest part of a launch, uh, of a space activity rather. So now we're in a situation where orbits are far more con congested, contested, and there's, there's a, 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 so much more going on in the environment than there was 20 years ago. So what didn't look as risky 20 years ago now is, is very much very risky. And so that's another reason that's really pushing on-orbit jurisdiction as an issue that we need to deal with in a situation like this, particularly if you have a commercial actor and that you also have a government asset that's nearby. And that just kind of brings up some of the issues we were talking about earlier today. I have two scenario actions that I think needed to play in this somehow. Uh, also having put satellites together for a living for quite a while. Uh, we had to sign off that we had adequate propellant in order to go ahead and super sync or deorbit our satellite. So the first place I would go in this entire scenario is with the company that had the sick satellite because it's their responsibility to get the damn thing up or down. Number two is after the collision, it's not game over. There's still debris out there, so what else is at risk? So if it's in the LEO belt, there's going to be other satellites that are potentially going to suffer. And if you don't do a heads up on that, then the Army becomes liable, potentially. So it's a trickle that has to be stopped. And well, bad news doesn't get better with age. Uh, and I think that the rules with regard to the satellite manufacturers having to deal with having adequate propulsion in order to take a end-of-life spacecraft or a six spa spacecraft out of orbit still exist. I'll make a really quick note. Um, you mentioned kind of going forward creating debris responsibility down the road and right now Again, because this hasn't really been litigated, we don't know how far that would extend. And so. Well, let's make this quite personal. What happens if a piece of this Indian debris hits the, the uh, International Space Station? What happens? I mean, this is yeah. that's a parallel scenario. Yeah. And, I, and, and it would, it, it, if you can prove that, if you can prove the chain of causation from that toward damage to the International Space Station, then they would be liable. The problem with that is how do you prove that? And we'd be setting a precedent if we're saying you create this sort of debris and down the road you could cause hundreds of millions of dollars of damage, you'll be liable for it. So the question is how certain do we have to make that analysis? So if we say, well, they created a 20% you know, chance of this happening, do we want to say, oh, that's enough? Right, because so, it's still a growing industry right now. So, so, so why isn't maritime law applicable? Because when law, when there's an absence of law, courts tend to look for examples, and maritime law deals with this. If you if you cause something to happen in the ocean, you you get penalized. You, you get to pay for the damages. If you have cargo aboard a ship, and something goes wrong on the ship. Then they have something called general averaging. All the owners of the cargo help pay for the disaster. So why isn't that precedent simply coming across in navigation and rules of the road? I mean, we have precedent in law to deal with this, called an ocean. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so um, and, and that, I mean, that's an excellent point. And when you have a new field of law like this, the thing to remember is that even though this is a new field, a lot of these issues have existed for a long time. The negligence has, that's, that's a really basic concept of law. It's been around for a while. 
what you have to do is you have to really see the similarities and the differences though. And so operating in space is really different from a maritime context. And I, I know the other panels can speak to this a lot better than me, but to, it, you can't, how do you investigate afterwards after an incident has occurred? It's in that moment a lot of times. We don't really have, um, we can't go to the site to see what's happened. We don't have the same kind of um, reporting system or, well, that's not a good example, but the maritime law is really based upon a long history of um, it's been, I think the point I'm trying to make is that maritime law is a long history and, Sorry? yeah, and you have state practice that goes back forever. And so if you're looking at it from, you know, if we don't have statutes in place saying this is what you have to do, then we look at what's the actual practice. We haven't been operating in space long enough in order to say this definitively, yes, this is what you do. We're still building those norms right now. And so if we set the standards right now based upon not that much practice. This, the example here, the on-orbit servicing, this, as far we haven't done this before. And so if we set the rules right now from one example, this is exactly how we're gonna handle this going forward, we're not really taking the full picture into consideration. And so we can, we can look to maritime law, we can take those examples to inform our approach, but we have to understand that they're not perfectly analogous. And you don't wanna take a concept from another area of law and apply it without consideration or without really making sure that it fits to the contours of this new area. So we can look at that for consideration, but we can't, if we set this precedent now, who knows down the road how it's gonna affect um, the growth of this field, the different ways that these companies are going to operate in the future, because we're setting incentives based upon what companies will know will happen if they do this sort of action or that sort of action. And I'm sorry if I didn't quite get to your question. Um, if, Really let me poke, let me, I want to poke at that a little bit, okay. just real quick, because I would make a horrible lawyer. I'll state that right flat out. I am a very impatient person. Um, I, 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 what I heard was we need to sit and wait and watch and see what happens. But I'm watching, and I have been watching for most of my career, and it is, it's, it's not doing this. I just can't keep getting example after example. It's dynamic and it's changing, and the risk the risk is going up appreciably. So what, what, what's the balance between the urgency that we have operationally and due diligence, if I pick the right term, for, for, for the legal community and the policy community? The thing we have to, um, and I mean, that's an excellent point, and that's really, I feel like that's been one of the major underlying themes of space law since the start, where we've always been seeing it grow, and the question is, how do we want to facilitate that growth, but also make sure that we're reining in and regulating activity? Um, law doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so it's, I think one way to look at it is law is applied policy in a sense, where we're seeing what's actually happening in the field. We're seeing what actors are doing that's good, that's bad, and take all these things into consideration. Because if we set a standard and we just say, you know, we don't care, this is what the liability is going to be. It's going to affect how people act in the future in ways that you can't really consider at the time. At the same time, if you don't set those standards, then we're going to get a major catastrophic event like this, and then now suddenly, instead of over the course of years deciding, well, this is the best approach, we have to decide right now. If this case goes to court, the court's not going to have the benefit of 30 years to kind of hash it out. They're going to have to say, well, what approach are we going to take right now? So it, it is a balancing act, but it's all of these things, it's going to come through actual practice. It's going to come through. And that's why when we're talking about setting norms, that's going to determine what the law is going to be. So, so yeah? I'll just talk. <laughs> you're, ignoring disaster, you're ignoring disaster in maritime. In maritime, there's a, there's a principle. When, when stuff happens, you go fix it. Safety of life first, but you go fix your mess. And the company that the companies companies involved figure out how to go fix it, and then they worry about how they're going to pay for it. That's what gets into the court. So if we don't accept that as a precedent, it's cowboys and Indians up there. And so we've got to 
we have a precedent. Why don't we go for it? Well, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not the companies that are responsible, it's the, the countries. So that, that's why I started out by asking about launching states, because state parties to the treaties are responsible for the activities of their governmental and non-governmental act actors in space. And so you, you, you really, if it's one set of variables, if these, all of these, um, the satellite that needs to be removed and the tug and the U.S. Army, if it's all U.S. assets, then it can be handled within the U.S. One thing that would really kind of light the fire and, and make, create the sense of urgency that you are so hungry for and that a lot of you are so frustrated that we don't have is if other country, if, if there were multiple countries involved, because then that, what that does is it ignites political will. It, it brings to the forefront of our consciousness the fact that we have a situation. And yes, there are some things that are, where, where precedent is, is there. However, it does leave some, it leaves us a little bit wanting more. So. For instance, the, the ability to do some forensics and improve that causation, that's very much more difficult and very much different in space. Two, um, this is a situation where you didn't have any loss of life because that army satellite was not actually um, online yet and you, you, were remove, you, you, know, you damaged a satellite that was already not operational and then you know, the tug did this and so the tug is the tug. So you have a different situation. We haven't fortunately had so many horrible incidents that we have a lot of precedent. But at the end of the day, when we do involve more than one country, then you have to, you have to kind of find a, some, some medium point where the countries agree to what, either what is their practice, if they're spacefaring, they have some, and if they're relatively new to it, what have they done to satisfy their responsibility for their non-governmental and governmental actors. But since we don't know those facts in this scenario, I would say that this, if it was all US to US, it could be handled here domestically, and, and it, it would be a relatively straightforward um, calculus from that point on. The problem is the debris. So we know about one, one debris-causing incident, and that's this Army satellite. However, what about all the rest of it? Where do we go with that? And so I think you know, what we're looking for right now is, can we draw from some maritime analogs? Can we find some international agreement? And what are countries actually, um, how risk averse are they now that we're getting to orbit? Because prior to this, we were only concerned with the things that were happening as we launched or re-entered. And now it's a whole different thing when we're in orbit, and particularly when we start bringing into the mix these non-traditional activities that are going to take place in orbit that right now are sort of out there without complete authorization and continuing supervision. So one main point that I wanted to make was that um, we're talking about space traffic management and say, just say this scenario is specifically based in all, all these parts are US based. And if there was an entity that, that was involved in this uh, space traffic and watching oh, these, these satellites are, are, we predict that these satellites are in this area, in this space, and the, the entity that lost control of their satellite were to report to them, we don't have the capability anymore to change where our satellite is going. We don't have control, we've lost control of our satellite. And then make the people aware that during the course of their mission, it's supposed to go through this area and make the other, the people who are in charge of collecting that satellite aware that, hey, you guys might, want, might not want to do that at this time because there's a satellite passing through there that has lost control or that satellite that has lost control, they, they should report to someone that they don't have control anymore of their satellite or to deorbit or uh, abort their mission because they cannot control what they have going on anymore. So prior, prior to the event of a collision occurring, report that you don't have control of what uh, you have out in space anymore would be a proactive way of getting that done. But who do you report to that you don't have control over what's going on with your mission anymore is uh, another uh, issue that, that needs to be looked at. So. I mean, I'll, the question is, who's, whose role is that? And you asked that, and who pays for it? Whose role should this be? And how is it funded? US Army, of course. 
<laughs> All right. Kick, we're going to start yeah. a kickstart here. Uh, uh, I have one question. Uh, uh, this is more like uh, uh, from a technical perspective, uh, rather than uh, like accounting uh, for damage as an engineer, I'm thinking like, is it possible? Like we see self-driving auto autonomous uh, car cars in, in, in today's technology. Like can we build some technology on the satellite which it, it can save itself from the debris coming uh, like with some proximity, some like it uh, with some intelligence, like uh, the debris of certain size, can it detect by itself and perform a slight maneuver to save itself? Is it is it possible? So, so I'll I'll answer that. Or I'll start to answer that one. And that is, I mean, technically, yes, yes, it's possible. Every satellite is built to be survivable to some, to some point. As, as Mariba points out, you know, there's a, a half million objects up there. And if you take things that are down to grains of sand, you know, we're, we're billions and trillions. So those are things that cannot be tracked with any radar or any optical system. And to some degree, you have to build in survivability against very small things that you'll have no warning against. Now, it's the question is the, the things that are larger the amount of energy that is in uh, um, a larger piece of debris is very significant and causes a lot of damage. And, and, and to a spacecraft owner, manufacturer, uh, you know, there is a, there's a balance. Weight. Weight is one of the, the biggest driving factors in the design of a satellite. And so when you talk about systems to look uh, 360 degrees, you know, uh, uh, spherically around yourself for anything coming in, uh, and all of the computers to do that, and all the optical systems to do that, and adding more shielding and adding more of this, uh, you now have priced yourself out of a satellite. And that's the dilemma that we're, we, we're faced. If it was zero gravity, Mariba, we wouldn't worry about the weight at all. I know. Inside joke. Um, I was going to say, like like he said, the the debris that we're able to track is up to a certain size, and so there there's object like you like you can track uh, the object size. A small object can cause just as much harm. But how do you know if if what's what's coming towards your satellite? What what size is it? Or if we're not tracking it, how do we even know that it's there? So the capabilities of attitude control um, need to be, you must be, you need to be able to have that attitude control, so ability to move and adjust your spacecraft. But in this uh, international highway sense, everybody needs to have that. So if you lose that, that's one way that you can look at it from what we're tracking. But you also have to take into consideration those very small objects that we're not tracking and how do you determine or know when that when uh, a collision is caused by those objects so i guess i have a, i have a question oh. i have a question and um is there any standard that we're all following to create these objects that we're sending off into space because we're putting everything else at risk So uh, I can say that there are some ISO standards that exist, but they're not for every single aspect of what goes on in space. Um, and so that there, are, there are some of those standards, and, and they're being formulated and, and, and kind of uh, uh, it's a work in progress, uh, so to speak. But we do have some ISO standards that, that are out there, and people are definitely encouraged uh, uh, to adopt these. There's also CCSDS, which is... Consultative Committee for Space Data Standards uh, that also map into satellite operations. Most space agencies subscribe to CCSDS. So there are some standards for sure uh, and, and even guidelines uh, to help out in this sort of stuff. But then it's, um, you know, how do you make it enforceable? And then I think this is where, uh, you know, Diane and Daniel can kind of speak to, to you know, how any given nation state can make that legal uh, from their own perspectives and that sort of thing. You make it enforceable by including it in your national law. So there was a gentleman, I think your name is Frank, 
am I right? Who was talking about the fact that an end of life or an end of mission uh, has to be built into all, every satellite that's launched. Absolutely spot on, true that. And that's actually being looked at and recalibrated right now. That's what the orbital debris um, FCC and PRM is all about. And not to acronym you to death, but the FCC is, is actually um, taking a, a proactive, it might not be enough, but it, it, it's taking a step at saying, hey, you know, um, it's not enough just to tell us that you have a plan, but tell us what that plan is. And, and that plan, what, you know, that's why it's in the, in the proposed rulemaking stage. What else do you, you out there, stakeholders in this community, do you think we need to include with regard to characterization and also reporting requirements at the end at, when, when there is an anomaly or, or when you get to end of life. And, and, and there are some, some guidelines, as, as Moraba said, um, that from an international perspective are not um, enforceable or binding, but once they get incorporated by reference into a country's laws, and, and in the U.S., we include that in the safety review for a, a payload, you know, for a launch and in the payload review, and also if it's something that's uh, governed by the FCC or by NOAA or by, by the government, then it's also included in, in that, that portion of the launch license as well. So, yes, the answer is there are ways to make it enforceable, um, but they rely upon uh, responsible national governments to promulgate those laws and those regulations to make those laws come to be. I'll just make a really quick comment about, um, you may think, why not have a treaty? Why, um, why are we looking at these other ways? Treaties are incredibly difficult to put together because if we abstract it a little bit, all the parties to the treaty, they come in with a certain amount of sovereignty that they maintain. And so by signing the treaty, they're saying, it's a little bit like they're saying, okay, we're giving away a little bit of our sovereignty for whatever reason in order to meet these requirements, meet these obligations. So you're asking all these different countries that don't have any obligation right now, legal obligation, to give up a little bit of their, of their sovereignty in order to step back and come together. And for a lot of countries, there's a lot of countries that aren't spacefaring right now, and so if you're giving up a little bit of sovereignty, you don't know where you're gonna be in the future. As technologies develop, if we come together and make some kind of treaty that in some unknown way will limit us in the future, well then you'll look back, well why did we sign that treaty? And it takes years to put them together and it, it's only binding on the countries that agree to it. And so if we can't get some large spacefaring nation to agree to a treaty, they don't have a legal obligation under that. Now there's some question of down the road once it becomes established, but all these little pieces, it's so hard to put it together, so that's why going on the national approach, if we're setting these standards on ourselves and each individual country does this, it's a lot easier for Congress in order to say, you know what, this is how we think she's, it's not <laughs> easy, it's certainly not easy, I don't want to intimate that, but it's a lot easier in order to get Congress to you know, say these are the things we want to do than to get the entire international community on the same page about these are the restrictions we want to put in place. Daniel, as uh, Frank goes, I think a good analogy of that is the campaign right now, I was mentioned a couple of times yesterday, uh, against lethal autonomy. So countries who don't have large armies and aren't headed in the, direct, the very technological direction, you see they're very ready in that process to move on towards international, international agreement. Uh, other countries, the Russians, the Chinese, the U.S., and, and even and other ones, um, I'm not saying they want to have lethal autonomy, but they're not ready to hand over a level of sovereignty yet until they have full trust. So I think that exact example, you, if you watch the ongoing lethal autonomy discussion, I think it is, is pretty clear that um, that's pretty good analysis, I think. I think a very case point in history occurred in February of 2009 when a Russian Cosmos spacecraft collided with Iridium-33. It was a head-on collision at 11,300 meters per second, and debris went everywhere, okay? Anybody care to guess what happened out of all of that? I think they settled before litigation, correct? I don't think they did a damn thing, to be quite honest with you. I don't think ever, anything ever came out of it. Oh, yeah, in terms of setting standards going forward. So, yeah. so there were, there were two, there was clearly a culpability trail. There were two nations involved, and frankly, don't ask, don't tell, nothing happened. And so 
if we can't establish precedent on a head-on collision, I don't know why we're arguing about our orbital debris. Just as a quick, sorry if I'm cutting off. That's what I think is really exciting about the commercial space. I mean, it's not exciting. That's really not the word to use. But when you have, if we have two American companies that could bring a suit in court, really they're very concerned about, they're not as concerned about these kind of international, you know, diplomatic concern. They're concerned about liability. They're concerned about their contracts going forward. And I think they're a lot more willing in order to set that precedent, especially if, you know, something happens in your satellite and you lose hundreds of million dollars, well, you don't, you're not gonna take that sitting down, right? You're gonna wanna do something about it. And so as we see development of commercial aspects, and that's why I think the international system is very difficult. It's not, there's a lot of interesting challenges with the international liability regime. But if we saw a suit in an American court, I could see an American court between you know two American companies being a lot more willing in order to set this kind of precedent and apply the standards. It would be an interesting question of first impression that a court would be willing in order to take that on. Of course, there's a lot of questions about whether or not they have jurisdiction and who the different companies are, but you're seeing different kind of incentives in order to resolve these disputes on the commercial side that you may not necessarily have on the international side. And, and, and I want to interject, and I think we have one more question, but I just want to make a point. And part of that, I think, is that it, the, it's the visibility. The people involved, I, 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 I'm, how many people in this room know of the Cosmos Iridium collision? We all do now, but a small handful, right? I mean, in the space community, this was big news. But the, the bulk of the people, now, when something happens that either takes out uh, a vehicle that's carrying space tourists or a space colony, or you lose direct TV, or the banking system goes down because you've lost GPS signals, that's when the, the, the outcome is going to be different than sort of the settle and let's just pretend it didn't happen. We had one more time for one more question. Yeah. So um, there was an assumption made at the outset that because companies want to make money, they're probably good actors. And I don't think that's necessarily a great assumption. <laughs> um, I think Dr. Jaw's student got it right in that unless we have some sort of controlling international body or some sort of agency that can look at this, it doesn't seem to me all that hard to imagine a scenario in which you have a cutout company or even engineers within a company who have been subverted to turn a satellite into a stealth destruction object. And if that's the case, then this isn't a matter of if, but when, and under what circumstances this becomes a threat to our national security. So in the absence of, sort of in, some sort of international governing body, this seems like it's just got to occur. Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I completely agree that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And here's the thing, folks. Name any domain of human activity that has been absent malice. None. So why do we think that everything in space is benevolence? That's naive at best. And the thing is, we need to be properly suited to assess and quantify when these things happen because I can put money on it. It already has happened. It's happening now, and it's just going to get worse, especially with the new transcontinental railroad to space that Elon Musk and, and, and Bezos and those folks are doing, which is awesome, making space cheap, cheaper to access, uh, but more and more countries are putting stuff up there, and not just them, but even India with PSLV, right? So I think we're ill-equipped to really get at what commercial actors may be doing out there, so it's not just governments, for sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you all on the panel. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, Matt. You're an Excellent. army mad scientist all right. now. Yay. And then here's your Very cool. coin. There's your piece oh, there. Great. Cool. Hold on, Pat. Man, let's not run off on them. You don't get No, no. We, we, get we've already what? Been, <laughs> no, no. We, we've already been proclaimed. Uh, okay. I need your name because we're going to proclaim you. But right now I have your coin. You, you give your name to Ian in a few minutes and you will have, you will have your thing with your coin. There's that. 
I had you already squared away. You want a surprise? By the way, I want to sue the software engineer. Yeah, yeah that's, that's when, it, when, it says, when this goes bad, I want to sue the software engineer. This is your, I guarantee you there are very, very few lawyers besides Diane that, that are mad scientists. There you go. Great, thank you. Thank you.